Hello, I'm Nathaniel Osgood. Today I'm going to be providing the briefest of motivations for why we conduct dynamic modeling in health and healthcare. The motivations for this really lie in the fact that we're confronting uh, ever more daunting health policy challenges. Um, these challenges are of diverse sorts, but they share the, the common feature that they are not merely complicated choices, but complex choices. Choices that, that confront us with systems where um, the behavior of the system as a whole cannot be merely reduced to, to the pieces. Uh, classic examples of this um, are, are uh, many and, eight and number. Um, an example where I've worked is uh, emergency department wait times, where the ostensible problem lies in the emergency room, but when we study it more closely, we'll find that the, the, the tangled nature of the system means that the drivers for that lie elsewhere. Um, the, uh, the concerns in the emergency room are, are strongly impacted by crowding in the wards, and crowding in the wards impacted by availability of, of spots, but also services in the community. Availability of services in the community drive people unnecessarily into the emergency department. So when we look for the, uh, to, to solve this problem, we find that the tangled nature of the system means that it's not amenable to siloed management. We have to think about the behavior of the system as a whole. We can't re merely reduce our study to pieces. Similarly with the opioid epidemic, we predominantly um, have, have had to deal with drug policy issues in a very siloed way to this point. But the opioid epidemic is one that, that whose, uh, whose uh, causes um, and whose uh, effects cross multiple sectors. Uh, and once again, the, the behavior of the system as a whole can't be reduced to simply a, a sum of what's going on in different sectors. There's a tangling of what's going on between things that guarantees that an intervention in one place will ripple through and, and affect uh, things throughout the system. Similarly with the antimicrobial resistance, where what what's going on in the farm in terms of administration of antimicrobials um, and in hospitals in terms of antibiotics affects people in their home and in each of those corresponding areas and, and long-term care facilities and many places in between. And siloed management here leads to and systemic dysfunction. So we're dealing here with with um, uh, being like blind, blind men in the elephant traditionally, dealing with each of the pieces in isolation, where really we need to capture the elephant. We need to deal with the, the elephant as a whole, not as simply a, a reduction to pieces. And when we divide an elephant up into pieces, we don't get two small elephants. We need to understand the elephant as a whole. Now this is a particularly keen need because we need to uh, explain things. We, we need to understand what's going on. Does the evidence out there support my hypothesis uh, regarding what's driving the system? Where is it likely to go next, etc.? And the challenge is if we just have theories in our head, their implication in terms of uh, the behavior they've result, that would result, the behavior for time, behavior for space, or for networks, is, is unclear to us. Um, if we're reasoning on the basis of mental models alone, it's hard to critique those and test in the clear light of day whether they're going to be consistent with the empirical evidence we see. Yeah. Even more fundamental to the quandary that we're in in a health policy level is that we have a need to intervene. We have to understand where to best intervene, um, how, how soon will I see effects, implementation science concerns, etc. And when we're dealing with a, a systemic issue, such as the opioid crisis or antimicrobial resistance, ED weights, or, or the many others there, uh, the quandary is there about where do we invest for action? Where to, to invest to yield the highest bang for the buck, to, to yield things that are high leverage? And the quandary here is we may have theories about the world, but as long as they're trapped in our head and, and somewhat inchoate, um, it's especially difficult to assess if we undertake certain interventions, what the implied dynamics will be. What will we see coming out of it? What will emerge from those interactions? And will they be consistent with our desired outcomes? When we're dealing with a situation like this, we're reasoning purely of models and, and that, are conduct, that are in our heads. Um, we are we are putting ourselves at great risk. Um, we're flying blind. We we have misperceptions about interpreting data from the system. We mistake uh, rapidly rising rates of reported cases as a sign of a of a crisis of incidents within the system, where really it's a sign of more effective reporting. For example, 
We have policy resistance, cases where the, the system pushes back against us. We undertake actions that we think are for the best, um, and, and we get uh, blowback. We get situations where the system pushes back against us and leads to uh, defeating of our original goals or even uh, adverse outcomes. We have difficulties coordinating effectively, planning and deciding about uh, what policies to undertake, designing a system, and, and uh, learning effectively from the experience of one area to another. And more fundamentally, we risk, we, we risk working at, in, at cross purposes with the nature of things, of banging our head against a brick wall that is just not going to give way. We end up having our resources um, uh, squandered because we're so busy bailing that we can't afford to plug the hole. We may have lots of resources, but their systematic imbalance assures that we go nowhere. Now, in order to address these needs, we turn to dynamic models. And these dynamic models can be viewed as, as articulating in a, in a uh, explicit, shareable, and precise way dynamic hypotheses concerning the, the causal structure of, of systems out there what we posit is going on in, in the system out there. And because we need to understand the effects of counterfactuals, new interventions, novel intervention portfolios, we articulate those models in a way that captures the positive causal structure out there. Now, these models have many uses that I've covered extensively elsewhere, but my goal today is to try to very quickly walk through some of the major motivations. Why do I model? Well, one big reason is to learn, fa to learn quicker to learn more reliably, to learn more deeply. Why is, is that enabled? Well, one thing is models help me make my assumptions shared and explicit. Whether they're qualitative models or semi-quantitative, such as this causal loop diagram from System Dynamics, or whether they're, they're more uh, precise in the form of, um, of uh, these uh, state charts um, and any logic which might interact, but which have very precise um, states a person can be in, um, uh, uh, actions that can change those states and rules under which they apply, or these ones from opioids. Um, by putting those that understanding out there in an explicit way, in a shared way, we can invite critique by others. We can take ideas out of our head, expressed in very inchoate ways, and put them into a fashion that's explicit um, so that they be, can be critiqued by groups, so that um, they can be tested by those with long experience in the system. This uh, being from a, a wonderful stakeholder session run by, uh, 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 by uh, Joanne Atkinson, uh, the Sachs Institute, and Louise Fre uh, Freebaron, uh, particularly at, at, um, uh, at ACT Health in Australia that I had the privilege of, of uh, being involved in. Another reason I model to learn faster is models help me make my assumptions explicit and testable. Far from being a crystal ball, models here are best viewed as, as learning prostheses. They're, they're tools for, for helping us think more quickly, more deeply, more reliably, more consistently through the consequences of our actions. Because we can put our thoughts about the model in a precise way, and not a way that's not only explicit but precise, we can run a model and, and test the degree to which it's, it's, uh, it matches up with uh, empirical evidence. We can take our, our articulation of our understanding, no longer inchoate, but captured in a precise form, see the implied dynamics, spatial across networks over time, and see whether it jibes with empirical observations. Uh, by such, they can, they can allow us to put those, that empirical evidence to use um, more quickly and, and more deeply. We can test more quickly, is our theory consistent with this evidence? And we can more quickly identify inconsistencies in our thinking um, uh, and learn, therefore, more effectively. Remedy our thinking and remedy the model that captures our thinking. So within a model, we have a systematic way of replacing confusion by learning. Um, uh, this, this accords with the, um, the comment by uh, Francis Bacon that truth will so sooner come out of error than from confusion. By putting a stake in a ground, by, by putting in place some explicit, shareable, testable um, thoughts about what's going on in the world, we can, we can check whether it jibes with evidence, and uh, if it doesn't, 
um, improve our thinking. Uh, the modern version might be fail early, fail often. Another reason that I use models is because we all use models and we can use their, their models in our heads, their mental models. The question is, what are we going to do to lower our vulnerabilities to, to the known weaknesses and very well documented weaknesses of, of, of mental models? And the reflection here is we can use computational models to consciously challenge, sharpen, falsify, and, and allow us to advance those mental models. So here we have a mental model, and by using the model and understanding through simulation the logical consequences of that model, by taking that, that precise articulation, running it out, and seeing its consequences, we can realize, oh, that isn't consistent with our understanding, and refine the model and refine the mental model that lies behind our simulation model. We can also use that model to motivate collection of new data in the world and to using that data test the model further to undertake interventions, test them against what we expected to happen with the model, and improve the model. Models here are not as crystal balls, ladies and gentlemen, but as tools for learning more quickly, more deeply, and more reliably from, from the evidence and from our experience. A failure to match a uh, failure to match empirical evidence is not a failure of the model so much as a success of the modeling in that it, it illuminated a latent inconsistency in our thinking and allowed us, by identifying that inconsistency, to arrive at a better understanding. A related point is that models help us understand what's going on. We can take an articulation of what's going on in the model and we can um, run it out and, and test us test it against uh, uh, the uh, empirical evidence and allow us to understand, you know, what's going on out there? Is, is, is this theory about what's going on uh, consistent? Now, this is taken to a whole nother level with modern machine learning techniques, uh, such as particle filtering and particle MCMC, such as we specialize in, in, uh, in, in combining with dynamic models. And here, we reground a model in, in incoming evidence. And this provides us a way of, of taking disparate lines of evidence and, and using them together with a model to, to illuminate what's going on across the system in a much more complete way, much as um, we take diverse uh, individual scans of a patient from a, from a CAT scan from all different angles and knit them together to give a 3D view of what's going on inside the patient, we can give a 3D view for what's going on within a system in a way that's probabilistic, reflects the uncertainty in the model on the one hand and the uncertainty in the evidence. We can give, as it were, a CAT scan for population health, understand not just what's directly observable, but what's implied by those observables and, and system structure jointly and other areas of the system. Now, Another use of these models, once I secure conviction in it, is to estimate intervention effects. Um, to, to use them um, with a model in which I, I have, I have uh, conviction, which has been tested uh, against uh, best evidence, um, to explicate the consequences of that model, to take it and combine it with descriptions of interventions um, and, and uh, understand what, theory, uh, what, what that theory together with the interventions of the world together with the interventions imply. So what are the logical consequences of those interventions given our best understanding of the world? This is something we cannot do effectively, as you may recall, with informal reasoning, but with simulation modeling, we can. And we can test the consequences of that intervention as enacted in the model against, uh, against what we're seeking to achieve in terms of health outcomes, thereby improve our intervention portfolio in silico within the model in ways that be prohibitively expensive, infeasible, potentially uh, unethical within the world. So here we run the model out you know, for a baseline case perhaps and for an intervention case, and we can test to what degree is the intervention yield great health gains, to what degree does it reduce crying health disparities, etc. Another reason I, I model is to anticipate what's coming. Um, this is particularly powerful when combined with these machine learning methods. Um, we take a model incorporating the best evidence now and we couple it with learning um, that, that takes each new data point and updates that latent state of the model that, that captures what we think is going on. We then 
can look forward with the model, with this periodically regrounded model, to anticipate what's coming up down the pike in a probabilistic way. So it might tell us over the next, uh, say, two years, or in terms of months, you were anticipating the, um, uh, the uh, a decline and then um, a, a possible sudden rise. Um, although there are uncertainties, there's this broad regularity that maybe for the next year or so, it'll be declining. In other cases, we may be told, hey, buckle your seatbelts. Um, incidents will likely be going up either very, very soon or pretty soon. Uh, get ready. That can allow us to marshal resources. Why else do I model? Because it's the least bad, ladies and gentlemen, of the alternatives. As Winston Churchill said, um, democracy is the worst of all forms of government except for everything else. So it is with, uh, with modeling. It's the worst of all alternatives except for banging our heads against the nature of the system. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have your attention. You can turn to my many other videos to find more details on some of these points.